Okay, great. Um, what I'd invite you to do while I'm speaking, and first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, and it's always exciting, especially with the way that online works, to be with people from all over the world, something that online does brilliantly without uh, everybody having to get on airplanes. Look at that, all those um, different places, fantastic. Um, so what I'd invite you to do just while I'm speaking is if you want to use the text chat to reflect on what I'm talking about, or to bring up something that you think might be relevant, then please do that as I'm speaking. If you've got a question that you'd uh, like to be considered for the Q&A at the end of the talk, then please put that in the Q&A function, you know, the question and answer bit, but do text chat as I'm speaking. I'll keep an eye on it, but we'll see how we go. Okay, so, Firstly, just so that you know um, where I'm based, I'm at the University of the Arts London, and that is a very large art and design focused higher education um, uh, organization institution that has that's made up of six colleges and a number of institutes all around um, central London. So it's it's uh, more than 20,000 students, well, significantly more than 20,000 students. Pretty much all of them are studying subjects where there's no right answer. So it has its own challenges. Um, and of course, like everybody else during the pandemic, we had to move online very quickly, which you can imagine was, was uh, yet yeah, an interesting thing to do. Now, just before I get into this kind of core of what I'm gonna be talking about, about uh, presence and belonging, I'd like to ask you guys a question um, to get us started. If you can answer this question in the text chat, that would be great. So it's a simple question. What do you miss the most when you're teaching online? Just jot down your answer in the text chat. What aspect of teaching did you miss the most? Seeing students' faces. I'll just give you a second. Contact, yeah, that's an interesting um, concept, isn't it? Physical presence. The emotion of the class, yeah, like the atmosphere of the classroom. I've got two screens here, so I'm looking at this screen for the text chat. Humor and irony. Yeah, irony is not something that is easy to do online. That's why they invented uh, emojis. Yeah, atmosphere, feedback, social exchange. Using all my senses, that's interesting. Somebody, somebody said smell. Um, which is quite an interesting thing that obviously um, you don't get the smell of the classroom, the smell of the lecture theatre, I guess. It's quite a powerful thing. Moving around, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Talking of which, I'm going to stand up because I think better when I'm standing up. And then I'll sit back down again later and see if this works. Okay, so um, the bond between the students and the tutor. So these, I think, I think the thing about this is that these are very... Um, these are quite physical, they're quite emotive things, aren't they? And I think that's that's a lot of what we lost when we went online. We lost the, the kind of physicality of things. Um, one way of looking at that is around this idea of materiality, the substance of stuff and embodiment, us kind of being in our bodies, being physically co-present with each other. Obviously, we, we could variously see each other on screens, but we lost the kind of the, that compelling emotional aspects of, of being embodied. Now, that's not to say that we're not embodied when we're also online. I'm here waving my arms around in my room. You're wherever you are as well. So whenever we're, we're online, we're also in a space and in our bodies, but we weren't physically co-present. Now, obviously, that was a challenge for an art design institution because we like materiality. We like making things, we like the texture of things, the feel of things. Um, and we like the idea of thinking through doing. Um, this, the same, there's an interesting link between art and design and science, technology and engineering subjects actually on that, because obviously anything that involves labs, as you know, anything that involves physical experimentation or what have you, um, also struggled during the pandemic. Um, so that the, there was this weird bridge between the challenges that art and design and a lot of the science subjects faced were quite similar, actually. Facial expressions as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So I just wanted to acknowledge that, that all of that, everything you're saying is incredibly important for teaching. Um, and we had that kind of removed from us. And the reason that I'm focusing on this is because I think as we exit the pandemic, hopefully, um, it looks like an awful lot of education is gonna stay online. More of it's gonna be online. I don't think that's going away. And I think what happened at the start of the pandemic is, is a, a sort of um, condensed way of thinking about it is that we lost our sense of place, okay? Our physical buildings were the place that we connected to, their very powerful identity. If you like, the physical buildings are the metonym, the reification, the symbol of the idea of our institutions. So quite beyond what they did for us practically in terms of co-presence, not being able to go into them made it feel like our institutions had disappeared despite the fact that the work carried on. And we had a really, really powerful attachment to them culturally, as well as from a practical point of view. So I see this as a, as a loss of place. We suddenly had a loss of place, a loss of place to belong to. And the short version of this keynote is, you can still create a sense of place online, but you have to deliberately design it in through the way that you teach, okay? Our buildings are like presence machines. The reason we go into buildings is to be around each other and to get all of the things that you missed um, that you're mentioning in chat. Uh, but when we go online, a lot of that doesn't come for free like it does with buildings, but it doesn't mean that we can't design it in. And this is something I explored. This is a little seven minute video that I made last year, which was called Desituated Art School, which was really just exploring what does it mean to be an art school when you have little or no access to physical buildings? It raises all sorts of interesting questions. Uh, one of them is um, definitely that we, you know, the way we understand what we do tends to be based around a building based paradigm. So even when we're working online, we tend to be using language that is designed for the physical world. So, for instance, Zoom is a meeting room, if you like. Now, it doesn't really work anything like a physical meeting room. It's completely different but we still borrow, it's a form of skeuomorphism where, where the um, new version of something, the new way of doing something has to borrow the kind of form or the language of the previous way of doing it. So the classic example of that is, is um, <clears throat> the internal combustion engine. Early cars looked like a horse-drawn carriage without the horse and were described as a horseless carriage, okay? because we couldn't, we haven't invented the language yet. And even though online learning has been around for quite a long time now, we still haven't really developed the language we need to talk about it independently of the idea of buildings. So this is what I'd like to explore. I think this is, I think this is the conundrum that we all have now. This, this is the question that's in front of most of us, which is what does it mean to belong to a de-situated institution, to an institution that is more than just its buildings, okay? I think the pandemic has tipped us from this position perhaps we had before, whereby our institutions were, were conceptualized as a building and we kind of built bits of digital around it and bolted bits of digital onto it and extended the building into the digital. I think now, in a lot of cases, what we're looking at is that our institution, the location of our institution is as much digital as it is physical, but we haven't figured out what to do about that. Now, what I'd like to do now, um, before I just carry on talking and talking, is I'd like to actually um, set you guys a, a little task, okay? So if you've got yourself a, a pen or pens and a piece of paper, that would be really handy. It's also something that you can do on screen if you've got a little drawing app, whatever you prefer. But what we're about to do is draw a visitor and residence map, which is to do with how we engage online, how we're present and how we're not present online, okay? I'm just gonna explain the process. If you wanna grab a pen and paper uh, whilst I'm talking, then that'd be great. Now, some of you, 
might have, ha I'm going to ask you the question, you can answer in test, text chat. How many people have heard of digital natives, digital immigrants as an idea? Yes or no? Let's have a look at the text chat. Yes, yes, six. Right, lots of yeses. Yeah. Now, just, just to note here, one of the reasons I like asking simple questions at the start of a session is because when, when I see the text chat moving up, I feel like I'm in a place with some other people. It's really encouraging for me. And it takes away that kind of spooky, maybe I'm talking to no one thing. Okay, We've got lots of yeses. And then I suspect the people who haven't heard of it decided to not say no. So that's always interesting, isn't it? But anyway, just to, just very quickly, you know, this was back in 2000, Mark Prensky came up with this idea that if you had grown up with digital technologies around you, then you were native to them and your use of them was as smooth as if you were using your first language. If perhaps the technologies appeared when you were an adult, then you could still be really good with those technologies, but it would always be a little bit like you were speaking an additional language. It's actually a metaphor of language when you unpick it. The problem with the idea is that it basically came to be known as old people don't understand technology and young people do. It became this kind of generation gap idea and everybody loves a generation gap. So it, beca it became very powerful and it became a reason why we kind of left a whole generation of students out in the cold and didn't really help them understand all of the digital practices, capabilities and literacies you need in and around digital that go way beyond just being able to press the buttons. OK, <laughs> everybody loves a generation game. I think perhaps we've been playing a weird digital generation game for quite a long time now. So it was a it was a little bit of a dangerous idea or it or it got misused. And I think it's fair to say Mark Prensky didn't help with its misuse. I came up with an idea a number of years ago called Visitors and Residents, which was in response to that. And there's a workshop that um, I run and people run all over the world, actually. The, this workshop and all the information to run it is online via my blog and colleagues helped me develop this. What we're going to do is just the very heart of it, just a little mapping exercise. And it's something that you can run with your students or with staff. And it's a great way of getting a conversation around digital started. So I'm just going to explain the visitor and resident idea and then we're going to use it to make a map. So I hope that's OK. Um, so importantly, it's a continuum. It's not two boxes. We're not trying to type people. It's not like you're either a digital immigrant or a digital native. You're not a digital visitor or a digital resident. These are modes of engagement, okay? So various different points, you'll be in more of a, of a visitor row, more of a visitor mode or more of a resident mode, okay? Almost managed to bundle them all up into some kind of weird portmanteau term there. Now, the easiest way to explain this sort of sliding scale is, is, to, is to describe either end but it's worth remembering that it's a sliding scale, okay? So when you're in visitor mode, the easiest way of describing that is it's a bit like you're, you think, you're thinking of the web, it's almost like it's un, an untidy toolbox. So you've decided what you wanna do, you open up the toolbox of the web, you find the tool you wanna to use, you use it and you put it back and you close the lid. So it's quite instrumental, it's quite focused, all right? There's some examples there on the screen of what that might involve. Importantly, you don't leave a social trace. Yes, you leave a data trace, although it's only in recent years that anybody's been worried about that, really. Um, but you don't leave a social trace, right? You're going online to do something quite specific and then you come away again. You used to say that you'd log off, but effectively nobody ever logs off any, anymore now. It's just you're either looking at a screen or not looking at the screen. So that's visitor mode. You're literally visiting the, the digital environment. Resident mode, the other end of the continuum. Really, you're thinking about the web as a series of spaces or places. Um, and your, the, your motivation to engage is to be co-present with other people. Now that might be co-present sort of live synchronously. It might be co-present asynchronously. It might be sort of 
somewhere in between, a bit like a lot of social media, you know, posting in Facebook, posting in Instagram, posting in Twitter. It's it's almost live. It's, it's this kind of not quite synchronous mode that seems to work quite well. But the point is that you do leave a social trace. So the things that you leave behind on the surface of the web, they can be connected back to your identity. It doesn't have to be your primary identity, it could be an alternative identity, but they're attached to an identity, which is more often than not you. Okay. And it doesn't have to be in super trendy technology either. You know, some people are really resident. They live in email. So the word resident is deliberate. This is about where we're living out part of our lives online. Okay. Now, interestingly, somewhere in the middle of that continuum is a really important aspect. It's a lot of what happens online. And I don't think this is given enough credit. This is where we're spending time with other people but in a known in a sort of known community like there's an edge to the people we know where the edge of that audience is okay so you could say that that's what we're doing at the moment right it, we're, we're quite resident i'm i'm super resident because i'm waving my arms around here you're pretty resident in the text chat but we know there's a certain amount of people here and there's an edge to it okay so that happens quite a lot somewhere in the middle at the extreme end of residency, it's usually stuff that's really visible and just out there, stuff that you can Google to. So when I'm tweeting, that's where I'm most resident. I hope this is making sense so far. Now, let's talk about the little mapping exercise. What we do is we add a vertical axis to that. Got yourself a quadrant. I do love a quadrant. And that adds context. So usually we'd have personal at the top and institutional at the bottom. Now, the reason this is important is when we were first researching all of this, it became abundantly clear that context was massively important to, uh, in terms of the, of the way that we engaged online. Now, that seems totally obvious now. When we were developing this, it was, it was a little bit less obvious, okay? So clearly, how you engage online and the places you engage online in a personal capacity are sometimes different from in an institutional capacity. Sometimes they overlap. Right, which is interesting in of itself. So here's a version of my map, which I probably need to. Um, yes, exactly. Uh, so that there is there's there's data traces when you're a visitor. So there's all forms of traces, but I'm focusing on the idea of social presence here. Okay, um, and it's true that we would all do well to be a bit more aware of the data traces that we leave. Thumbs up. Nice. It's a different form of presence. Okay. So here's my map. Um, I'm pretty resident in Twitter. If you want to find me, then you DM me in Twitter, even to the extent that sometimes people in my team at work will DM me in Twitter rather than email me. Uh, I mainly talk about work in Twitter, very occasionally talk about personal stuff. Sometimes I'll tweet paintings and things like that. So it's mainly down there. I blog, that's in the resident institutional quadrant because it's very much my opinions, but it's always about work. It's always about education, digital education. Skype, that's kind of gone now because this map's perhaps a couple of years old, but I used to have Skype on all the time because I was working for people from all around the world and they could just contact me anytime they like. I think now, because of the way my institution works, that's now Microsoft Teams, similar kind of technology. Let's go to the other side, top left, email, personal. I'm not particularly chatty in email. I just organize things. So it, I'm very visitory there. I'm not really socially present. I've got email work down in the visitor institutional quadrant. I only really talk about work in work email, but I'm a little bit more socially present. I'll actually, you know, I'm a bit more there in work email than I am in personal email. And Facebook, top left, I, I, I'm part of uh, a, a club, uh, a, a running club, and I, that's the only reason I have Facebook now, so I can check when things are happening. It's like a terrible address book. I'm really not there. Once or twice a year, I'll like something that somebody said. Other than that, so, you know, whilst it's social media, I'm not really resident in it. And then there are other things in the middle where everything's kind of collapsed together, okay? Google Docs. All of those Google apps, it's just a mess of work and personal and all sorts of stuff. It's all mashed up in the middle. Okay, hopefully that was enough information for you to get started on your map. So literally, if you grab a bit of paper, you can draw the quadrant on it. 
I don't know why I'm showing you this, because you should know what that looks like. So you can draw a quadrant on it and start drawing your visitor and residence map. We're just going to do that for a few minutes, OK? I'm going to leave you to do that for a few minutes. I will chat very gently in the background, but you can slightly ignore me. Grab a pen and a piece of paper, start drawing your map. And I'm going to give you a place to upload it to when you feel you've got it sort of mostly on the way, All right? I'm going to sit down now because it will stop me talking quite so much. Do blip me a question in text chat if you're just completely stuck about that process or if you've got any questions. In the meantime, uh, no, I'm Davo White. I'll put it in. That's me in Twitter. I've been a bit quiet on Twitter recently because work's been super busy. So, there's a URL that I think somebody can help me with and post in the text chat. Um, that is the Padlet that I'd like to chuck your maps into. We call this an interactive keynote, okay? So if you can throw the, there it is. I click on it myself, but I don't know what's happening with my screen sharing and all the rest of it. Now I've I, I'm I've got that padlet. Now this is not a race or a competition, but once you've got a little, once you've got a version of your visitor and residence map, even if it's really rough, go to the padlet. Probably easiest to do it on your phone. Go to the padlet, take a photo of your map, and upload it into the padlet. Clearly, you can keep that anonymous. And if the Padlet decides not to work, then that, that's fine. We can, you know, I think it's still a useful exercise, but it's quite nice to see each other's maps. There's already a nice question in the, in the question and answer box as well. So, you know, if, if something that you'd like us to consider at the, at, you know, in the Q&A comes to mind, then do post it in question and answer. Hello, Berlin, Bulgaria and Finland. Croatia, South Africa. That's just what I've got in my text chat at the moment. Chilly, nice. Ah, now somebody posted something in Padlet, which is always nice because that shows that that works. Um, how do you add your image? Okay, you can click anywhere on the screen. Let me just show you. If I bring this into here, you're probably seeing that because I think I'm sharing my screen. Can you see the Padlet? Just give me a quick yes if you can see the Padlet. I know I'm now asking you to do multiple things. Lovely. Okay, great. You can you can click on that little plus, or you can just click on the screen. I think there you go. And when you click on the screen, then you get these options. The easiest thing to do is you can if you're on your phone, you can click take photo, and take a photo, or you can do it by uploading the picture as a file. There's a the first map. So that gives you an idea. I'm going to leave this up on screen so you can kind of see them appearing. Um, this is where we get what I'd call like sharing inception, if you know that film, where you probably now have the Padlet up and zoom up with a picture of the same Padlet in, and then you start stabbing away at the zoom one and it isn't really the real one. There's a second one. It's coming sideways. I like sideways maps. That happens quite a lot. But it's great to see some people getting those in there. Um, I can see that this first one has got work email here, Facebook up here, Twitter here. So it's a good combination of things. 
and personal email. So there's another person who's who's quite sort of just administrative in their personal email. Hello, anonymous. Ah, there's another map. There's a super basic map. Twitter and email, but the principle works. Okay. I'll just give you a little time to carry on posting maps and we'll, we'll just we'll just do this for a little bit longer again if you've got any questions in the meantime do put them in text chat that there's anonymous people all talking to each other good morning so the interesting thing about this is that it makes it makes visible the virtual. One of the big challenges with anything to do with the digital environment is it's an entirely, it's an almost entirely imagined space. There's no real maps of it. Each of us has our own conceptual map of the bits of the digital environment that we engage with. But the way that we conceptualize um, the digital environment is um, different. And the bits of the digital environment we connect with and with which motivation is different as well. So the, you know, drawing the maps is quite a useful exercise. I think somebody's just put a background in there. Um, drawing the maps is a useful exercise in of itself. But if you're doing this with a group of people, actually the conversation you then have about your maps is, is a really valuable way of getting a kind of shared understanding of a whole range of motivations to engage. Um, that works well in the physical room. You can do it online as well. Now, what I'm not going to do today, because there's 200 of you, is to have um, a, a kind of discussion around the maps. I just wanted you to see some people's maps so you can kind of see how the process works, okay? So that, that isn't a map either, but that's fine. I'm just gonna give it a couple more minutes. If you've got a map that's mainly on the way, then don't, yeah, don't worry if you've just arrived late, um, you can go back over the recording or you can visit my blog where this is sort of all explained. I'm just gonna give you a few more minutes for a few more people to post their VNR map. So if you've got one that you've, got most of the way that you never get it right first time it's something that you have to keep going back to so just post what you've got there's another one there and obviously these don't have a lot on them necessarily because we're doing it quickly there's another one appearing we'll wait for a few more there's another one linkedin's appeared what else is that this is what we have to do um WhatsApp. I think there was a Viber on there. There's a little conversation happening in another post. So be brave and post what you've got so far. Just got a couple more minutes. Have a go at wrangling Padlet. Now, as I say, I've done this with groups of, of, of co with colleagues. I've done this with uh, students, and it's yeah, it's a great way of getting a discussion started about how how digital may or may not work. One more minute then, some other things appearing. Great. Well, that's an interesting one. So that one is very visitory. And that reminds me that, um, you know, this isn't that this isn't the visitor mode or resident mode. It's not that one's better than the other. It just depends what you're trying to achieve. I think sometimes people feel like being digitally literate means being really, really resident. Uh, and it's not necessarily about that. Now I saw the screen move there and I'm not sure what came in.
yeah that, so that's a good point from linda there that often it's difficult to keep up and i think this is one of the things that tends to come of a discussion around the visitor and resident maps is that it's important to decide what you're trying what you it's important to decide what's important to you and where you want to be active and how you want to spend your time and in what mode for what reason so that you've got agency over the way that you're engaging i think a lot of people feel like they're almost pushed around by the digital environment and they find themselves in get you know spending ages in social media when they don't really want to or whatever it might be so there's some more maps coming in there that's lovely it's really nice to see these you know one of the things that i like about this process is you get to see people scrolling and it, again it feels quite human one of the difficult things with the digital environment i find is that it makes everything quite precise and quite formal so it's quite nice just to see people having drawn little sketches because you can you get a sense of the person on the other end of the sketch just a few more seconds then now i'm sure there's loads of you out there with with, with your maps um and i hope that's been a useful process um, and thanks to you, to, to, to those of you, that's a social network map. That's a different thing altogether, isn't it? Um, so we've got some interesting things going on here. Um, what I'll do is I'll leave that Padlet open and we can come back to that at the end. So if you're interested, you know, if you've got a map and you want to post it, you want to carry on and you want to post it, then you, you know, clearly you can go to that Padlet whenever you need to and upload but you can see different people's maps coming in there hang on what's that one well, that one's quite detailed isn't it discord that's been interesting over the pandemic as well and this person's put direction of travel on which is always interesting so it would seem that perhaps they're in facebook but they're, they're moving towards more of a visitor mode and away from a resident mode They've also got quite nice there's somewhere i'm guessing they're somewhere in london is that no no that's not anyway look i'm just trying to it's weird detective work it's another one with some icons oh there's all sorts piling in now okay lovely so you can have a look around that at your leisure what i'm going to do is stick to my timings and move on to the next section i'm going to stand up again actually because like i say it kind of helps me to think so that's that. yeah that seems good all right so now my desktop's all got mess all over it which i quite like thank you for doing that as i say i hope you found it a useful process you can go to my blog and find the kind of method of doing that um, and do that um, for yourselves with groups of people as I was saying, just to re-emphasize, the conversation that you have when you're talking through your maps is, is sort of almost more important than the map itself. I just wanted to sort of bring that up as part of the session. So residency as a mode of engagement is about presence. Um, it's about social presence, it's about co-presence. And we, you know, during the pandemic, I think we learned that whilst we're probably okay, I can still see people putting things into the Padlet over here, which is quite nice. What we learned of the pandemic is whilst we're okay at perhaps delivering content, giving talks like this online, that didn't necessarily feel too strange. Um, generating or facilitating that sense of presence that perhaps we get in buildings, but trying to do that online, the kind of resident end of things was quite, difficult okay because so, we lost our sense of place we lost that place where that happens and what's important to me is to emphasize that there are multiple modes of digital presence as you can see from your maps okay everybody's got two or three or four things on the resident end of their map okay and those things uh, help us to be co-present or socially present in different ways all right i think what happened during the at the start of the pandemic we did what i call practice mirroring which is like a form of skeuomorphism that i mentioned before whereby um we looked for the we immediately looked for the thing that felt closest to being in a building 
And that was all about seeing people's faces. So we went straight to Zoom, we went straight to Teams, we went straight to Blackboard Collaborate. But actually there are many different modes of presence as I've been hinting at already today. You know, the text chat is a great mode of presence, posting things into Padlet, seeing people's work sat next to each other, it's a great form of presence, okay? And then there's me in this little box waving my arms around. So you can cut presents up however you like. There's lots of different models of this. There's a good model which is based on, um, is it uh, cognitive, social, and something else presents? I can't remember. Um, I I've listed off uh, synchronous and asynchronous, which a lot of people have been talking about. This is at the moment we're synchronous. Um, the Padlet is kind of synchronous, but it will stay there. So that becomes asynchronous. Collaborative, I think, becomes really important. Obviously, in art and design, um, collaborative pedagogies are, are, are fundamental. And then there's social presence and ambient presence. And I think ambient presence, which I'm just about to explain, is the one that we really missed and is one of the hardest things to recreate. Okay. So, um, Ambient presence, actually the easiest way to explain ambient presence is that's exactly what's happening in this picture here, okay? So that's people studying in a kind of coffee shop somewhere. Uh, they're not talking to each other. They might not even know who the people are around them, but they've chosen to go there to work because they like to be around people and it helps to um, motivate them. And it's a, way of, it's a way of feeling that you're part of something. It's a way of feeling that you belong without necessarily um, even knowing the people around you. It's one of the major reasons that people come into our buildings uh, as universities is they'll sit in the library and they'll work quietly. It's just a good vibe, right? What's the equivalent online? It's quite difficult to say, isn't it? I guess some forms of social media are a little bit like that. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's a tricky thing to recreate ambient presence, but I think it's really important and worth considering. So here's some examples that I've um, been thinking about over the pandemic and before. Um, breakout rooms are social spaces, okay? So anybody who's run a bit of teaching in a platform like Zoom and then asked their students to go to breakout rooms or even a you know, collection of colleagues, go into little breakout rooms. Quite often when people come back from the breakout rooms, they haven't actually done the thing that you've asked them to do and you know what it's like when you, you know what it's like if you've been in that situation you, you you end up you're in a breakout room and the first question is wait what are we supposed to be doing and it's quite a difficult thing to do now we got some great feedback actually from uh, one of our staff uh one of our teaching staff over the pandemic that said the thing about breakout rooms is if you put three or four students in a breakout room, they rarely do the exercise, but they really get to know each other because it's a small enough group that it becomes really social. And because they're sort of supposed to be doing something together, it kind of drives them to chat. So I really like that idea of, of the breakout room being the equivalent of the chat in the corridor or the equivalent of the water cooler chat that we've all been missing. Validating not owning students' bases. So often students will set up an Instagram account or a WhatsApp group of their, of their own accord or a student rep will do that. I think, I think a really powerful thing that we can do that sometimes we underestimate is we can validate that space but not take it over. So we can say, look, somebody self-organized a WhatsApp group or if you haven't, then you probably should think about it. That's brilliant. I don't want to, I don't want to be part of it, but I really recommend you do that. It's a really helpful way of you guys um, supporting each other in your studies, okay? Um, too busy chatting in the breakout room. Absolutely, Vicky. Um, because it's that little, I think the breakout room feels like just a little window of what it was like when we were in buildings. Anyway, next one. I need to keep an eye on the time. Um, architecting liminal spaces. It's a little bit of an academic way of putting it. I think what I'm saying is everybody's been sort of talking about the fact that there isn't the water cooler online, there isn't the corridor, there isn't the lobby. So build it, right? We have to make it. That it's a bit like the visitor and residence map. We have to start making a map of the digital environment and we have to start gently socially ascribing kind of modes of engagement to bits of it. Now it's a really difficult thing to do uh, because you can't, 
you, you, you sort of can't formally create an informal space. So the formal, our informal spaces in our buildings are an effect of the formal spaces, like the coffee shop wouldn't exist unless the lecture theatre was there, right? Um, so the question is, we've got like our Zoom lecture meeting room, what's the antechamber to that? What's the, what's the corridor? How do, we, how do we arrange that in a way that doesn't kill it? Perhaps it is the WhatsApp group that the students own, and perhaps that's fine. Perhaps that's how it should be but it's something that's really interesting to consider and i think one of the hardest things about the digital environment is largely a corporate environment right zoom's a corporate environment teams a corporate environment etc cetera, etc cetera. and it kind of forces us into the formal it's very very different i had this legendary thing when i was an undergraduate we had a study skills tutor who said this thing that i've never forgotten she said remember to always put five minutes aside each day to be spontaneous that totally blew my mind like organized spontaneity really so that's the problem right and leaving a trace all right um i'm going to go on and talk about that a little bit more i've seen lots of those maps have appeared in the padlet you're leaving a trace okay when i look at that padlet i'm not really seeing maps i'm kind of seeing people or the trace of people okay a lot of the environments we use we don't really leave a trace once it's shut down, everything disappears. So I think being socially present through what we post rather than just in the moment through the webcam can be really, really powerful. And this is where I've become suspicious of this kind of environment. I mean, it, it's fine in, in this kind of keynote mode because we've, by saying it's a keynote, we've all sort of tacitly agreed to engage in a certain way, even though I forced you to do things as well, not forced, encouraged. Um, what's interesting is that the, the, the sort of Zoom webcam environment, we imagine it's a place because it's sort of got people in it, but it sort of hasn't got people in it as well. Also, it tends to show you a picture of yourself looking back at you, which is like this permanent reminder that you're not really, that you're kind of in your room, but you're also there, but you're sort of not, and it becomes really, really uncanny. And you're kind of, you've got a wall of people looking at you, but are they looking at you or? So it actually falls into the category of a non-place as defined by this anthropologist, uh, Marc Auger. Mm, have I pronounced that correctly? We'll never know. Um, and I think what's really important, because this is a principle that we can take into all places, digital or physical, is to do with, with, with your agency, with your belonging, with your ability to belong, okay? So a really good example of a, of a physical non-place that uh, Mark uses is the baggage hall in a big airport. Why is it a non-place? Sort of nobody appears to really work there. Everybody who passes through it just passes through it. You can't have any impact on that space. If you leave something there, or if you try and change something, you'll get told off or it'll get moved, okay? You have no ownership over that place whatsoever. It's completely transitory um, and just totally functional. So it's really interesting to consider which of the, our digital spaces actually are non-places. Now, what I'm proposing here is that we make a space, so a space, is just a location with a collection of affordances, okay? So we visit spaces, but we don't inhabit them. We make a space into a place through our teaching, okay? And through the way that we uh, help create a kind of sense of collective agency over that space, which, should, which means that students have to have a certain amount of control. They have to leave things behind. It might get a bit messy. And thinking about all these things, I, I collected them together into this model. So we've, I've been talking about um, presence uh, through the idea of residency, co-presence, that kind of stuff. Uh, now I'm sort of beginning to talk about the idea of placemaking and how we have to actively make places in the digital environment uh, in a way that we don't have to when we've got physical buildings because that place is provided for us. Although some of the things still apply. And I say pedagogy, the way that we teach, 
is what helps us to make places through presence. That's how I connect these things together. Now, all of that can get very confusing and muddled up and detailed. But ultimately, I think what I'm saying is when we're design teaching, especially in the digital, if our headline design principle is how do I facilitate as much presence between us as possible, then I think things make sense from there on out, okay? Things start to fall into place. So here's some examples of, of presence. Um, I'm going to rattle through these. Hands, all right? So I've, st I've stood up. Here's my hand. Uh, you can see me from this side. You can see me from this side, OK? Um, this is, an, this is uh, one of our academics talking about um, uh, how to use a traditional camera. <clears throat> He rigged up a webcam at a different angle so that he can he can show hip, uh, students him working with his hands. Not a big deal, but it creates a different kind of sense of presence than this constant face business. Work. We've got a um, digital portfolio site that all the students can use. It's used a lot in curriculum. Uh, they post their work up in progress. Okay like the equivalent of what you'd have in a notebook or in a portfolio. Now, what is important here is that you can make these portfolios so they're visible to each, you know, they're visible to a group of students or they're visible to the world, okay? Presence through work is really, really important, <clears throat> but involves creating a culture amongst our students where they're prepared to share work. Now, it's kind of hardwired into what we do at my institution. But, you know, that's what buildings do really well, especially in art and design, the studio, you see people's work, you feel their presence, you get to know them through their work. Whereas um, perhaps a more traditional version of education is that your work is kept private. You write an essay, only you and your tutor sees it, you get a mark, nobody else reads it, okay? Does not create a sense of presence. So moving to a position whereby students are comfortable to share their work, that's version one. Version two is to share their work in progress. It's a difficult thing to create the kind of scaffolding around that to make that happen, but I think it's a really important form of presence, just as the Padlet maps are, because that's filled up quite nicely now, I can see. Um, whiteboard, uh, that's quite fun. I like how messy that one is. So this, this is just one way that we were asking questions. I could have done that today, but we did it in the text chat. Uh, and I think Digital mess is a really beautiful thing. It kind of counters that formality. I love it when people try and write with a mouse and then discover that it makes their handwriting look completely insane. Um, but when you when when I asked that when we asked that question, all of these things started to appear. It, you immediately felt like you were together with a collection of people in a way that was actually more powerful than if everybody had their webcams on. This is a mural board that I used in a conference. Uh, you mural, Miro, all these kind of things. What's really important here is that they're spatialized, so you can see uh, how ideas connect relative to each other. A lot of people think in a spatialized way. They like mind maps, they like post-it notes. And again, that's what we miss online if we're not careful because everything becomes linear. The other advantage of these environments you switch the cursors on, you kind of see where everybody is relative to each other. So, you know, I, this is where, I'm not gonna go into this in detail. I've got a few minutes, but I'm not gonna go into it in detail. But I think it's really important to not be dragged towards the right-hand side of that, the realistic space. So there's a lot of talk about Zuckerberg, the metaverse, virtual worlds, and all the rest of it. They're an attempt to recreate the real at some level, but they become really uncanny and can actually be really, really alienating um, for some people. Just in the same way at the other end of this continuum, you'll notice I like a continuum, the, the everybody having their webcams on is actually sort of a, a, a kind of alienating embodiment because you're sort of there, not there, kind of there, like I said before. In the middle is what I'd call a schematic space. It's not trying to be real, but it is spatialized and that's really powerful, okay? Um, so I'll show you some examples of what I'm talking about. Um, so realistic, that's an ancient picture of me in Second Life, okay? From back in the day, um, non-space, if you're from the UK, you'll know what that image is, but obviously that 
that was a local council meeting where it all kicked off and somebody posted the recording and it became a quite a hilarious news story in the UK. And then a schematic space in the middle. And it's weirdly powerful, the schematic space. And it's partly because we're brilliant at imagining ourselves into things. You know, we're good. We read a novel. We imagine ourselves into that world. We watch cinema, TV. We imagine ourselves into the screen. OK. This is just an example of what I'm talking about. We, uh, a while ago, we, wa we wanted people in a Zoom environment, a group of students to um, do a round robin discussion where each of them would speak in turn. How do they know which one comes next? You don't know, the screen's different for everybody else. So we literally just drew a picture of a table and put their names around it as if they were sitting at a table and then they went clockwise. It organized the discussion, but it also created this really powerful sense of togetherness because they could imagine themselves sitting next to someone. They could imagine themselves in that room, even with such a basic diagram. And that's an example of schematic space where we can really help people feel present through really, really simple things. There's some really good spatialized chats now where you're just like a little icon wandering around, but as you get closer to people, the sound gets louder, you can join conversations, you can move away. I think those things are really great. Here's an example that a colleague of mine did because he read that blog post and then did this with his students where you could pick the chair you wanna sit on, you could put it around a table with your name, and then you can go to the snack table, grab a bit of cake or a biscuit or a drink and bring it back to the table and put it in front of you. And when you go back into that space, it's still there. It really created a sense of cohesion amongst a small group of students. Um, yeah, so you, it, it's, you, you can, Padlet's almost there, Anna. Uh, I think there are versions of the way that you set up Padlet where you can sort of pick where you drop your thing. I set it up so they're just all stacked in, okay? Um, so, that's just, I just wanted to get through some examples of, you know, what I mean by um, how we can facilitate presence. They, they're not, they don't have to be super high tech. Let's not all rush to put VR headsets on. That might work, it might not work. But, you know, even if you're just five people writing a shared Word document or Google Doc at the same time, that makes the space of a word processor into the into a place of co-work okay and you move from visitor mode to resident mode just because you know that people are around you and you can see them moving things around it's very very compelling um just a couple more thoughts to round off i know i've thrown a lot at you here uh and thank you uh, thank you again for sort of engaging in, in text chatting um it's easy to get focused on individual sessions, on designing individual sessions, but obviously the real art of it is how different activities flow into each other. So this is just something I made a little bit back in the pandemic. Learning design becomes incredibly important because it's not necessarily about just having one place where everything happens. It's about how the different locations we teach in, whether that's different digital locations, different physical locations or a combination of all of them, which is what it's most likely to be. How do they flow into each other? What are we taking from one space into the next? And then what are we taking out of that space and into the, into the, into the next? Personally, I think where teaching and work, learning works really well is where the physical activity flows into the digital, the digital flows into the physical and it overlaps and it, it coalesces, okay? And that's to do with the design of our learning. That's a big step beyond the traditional, you know, lecture, lecture, seminar, tutorial, essay, right? Um, if, yeah, I'm not saying that that doesn't work. I'm just saying this is very different. It takes quite a lot to design. And I think that's something that we're struggling with. But I, when, it, when we do it well, it works brilliantly. And this is why I've employed quite a lot of learning designers recently. Um, and then I think, I want to say lastly, but that would mean I'd have to remember what order my slides go in. So I'm just going to double check. Nah, second to lastly. What time? Oh, look at that. We're doing good for time. Shared endeavor. OK, none of this works unless you and your students, you and your colleagues consider education to be a shared or collective endeavor. 
right? None of the presence, belonging, placemaking, none of it makes any sense unless it's underpinned with this philosophy. Now, you might not agree with the philosophy, that's fine. I'm not saying there aren't other approaches that work. I'm this is just a kind of me being super honest that behind this is this philosophy, which is relates very closely to my institution, but actually I think, I think it's important across the board, uh, whether that's school, university, in any subject area, is that there's always a tension between the idea of education as characterized as, you know, consumer and product with the curriculum being the product and the student being the consumer versus this idea that knowledge is socially constructed that our students do best when they learn together when they support each other that peer learning is at least as valuable as student teacher learning all of these things Vygotsky Paolo Freire all of that stuff right so clearly this idea of shared endeavor is is in tension with that commercialized version of education all right which i'm not saying can't be effective in some contexts but certainly what we do at my institution is, is more about shared endeavor and it's definitely in um, tension with the banking model of education it's also somewhat in tension with the fact that we rank students as we do at my institution as well and so there's always this thing to be negotiated between generating a culture of shared endeavor versus at the end of this you're all going to get a mark and some of you are going to have done better than others right now we're never going to solve that problem i'm just being honest about it there is a tension there and we have to explicitly negotiate that and i think it's useful when you put that on the table for students okay um and then lastly, I think this is a challenge that we're all facing that the pandemic has, has, has really highlighted is that um, this is a tweet that I've had this earlier in the year, but my point here is that um, it takes quite a lot of time and energy to facilitate that culture to generate a, a sense of shared endeavor, whether you want to call that a subculture or community, it doesn't really matter. The point is that it takes time to do that. One of the things I heard over the pandemic occasionally was, I can't believe I've got to do all of this social presence, ice breaking, chit chat facilitation before I can start teaching. And, I'm, and my view is, well, no, that is teaching. But the way that we model teaching tends to be based on, you know, contact hours and independent study time. We still, we don't yet really model teaching on a basis that takes account of the amount of time to work in the mode that I'm suggesting. And I think that's that's a kind of structural challenge that we have. Uh, most of our institutions would probably say, oh yeah, facilitating a community of students, we're all for that. Whether the actual sort of way the timetable works allows us to do that within the hours that we're paid for, that's a different question. So I want to acknowledge that too. So just to, I'm just gonna come back to, I'm gonna sit down on my feet for ages um just to um come back around to that model everything i've been talking about is hiding in this model somewhere this is the sort of touchstone for me this is what i come back to when i go down a cul-de-sac or get confused i haven't explicitly unpicked it really in this session but that's kind of in the background so i just want to say thank you for listening and thank you for engaging